two papers. We start with the, the paper analyzing blockwise lattice algorithms using dynamical systems by uh, Guillaume Arne, Xavier Puyol, Damien Stella. The, the speaker is Xavier. Thank you. So I will present uh, the paper, Analyzing Blockwise Lattice Algorithms Using Dynamical System. Uh, as you say, it's uh, joint work with uh, Guillaume Moreau and Damien Stelle. So the context. Uh, lattices are mathematical objects that provide uh, art problems that can be used to build various cryptographic primitives such as uh, encryption, hash functions, and so on. And the best known attacks against lattice-based crypto system rely on what is called uh, lattice, uh, blockwise lattice reduction algorithms. That's why we want uh, here to study this algorithm to assess the security of lattice-based crypto systems. The most widely used uh, reduction algorithm among the lattice reduction algorithms is called BKZ, and that's the one uh, we will study in this talk. It's the widely used because in practice it's the most efficient, and despite the fact that it's not well understood in theory, that is, no reasonable time bound is known on the running time of BKZ. Our contribution is to give a first worst case analysis of the BKZ algorithm. And to do that, we use a new technique. We introduce a model of the algorithm, which in, its, in itself can be interesting to understand other things on this algorithm and other lattice reduction algorithms. So the talk is in two parts. Uh, I will first give a few reminders on lattice, lattice reduction, and give the, result, the main result. And then I will explain the main ideas behind the result and uh, the model that we used to obtain it. A lattice uh, is a grid of points. It's, it's a set of all lin integer linear combination of a fixed number of in linearly independent vector of n linearly independent vectors. So here we have uh, two vectors that generate the lattice represented by uh, the black dots. The two vectors are called a basis of the lattice. And as long as the dimension, the number of vectors is at least two, all lattices have infinitely many bases. The problem of lattice reduction consists in finding, finding a, a basis of the lattice made of rather short and rather orthogonal vectors. For instance, a uh, more reduced basis of this lattice would be this basis. So when the dimension is two, it's easy. When the dimension, it's when the dimension grows that it becomes harder. Um, so finding reduced lattices is hard when the dimension grows. Now, all bases of the same lattice have the same determinant. It's an invariant of, the, of a lattice. And the ratio between the determinant, the, no, between the first vector of a basis and the determinant gives a measure of how well a lati uh, basis is reduced. So this ratio will be called the Hermit factor. Uh, the, and to make things simple, our goal is to find bases of lattices with small Hermit factors. It is known that the Hermit factor can always be made as small as the square root of a sequence that grows linearly in n, the, the lattice dimension. A more precise way to measure the the lattice reduction consists in considering the Gram-Schmidt uh, orthogonalization of the bases. 
I will keep this the same notation during the whole talk. Xi is equal to the log of the norm of the ith uh, gram schmidt vector of a basis. And considering the shape of the Xi uh, shows how well the lattice is reduced. There are various uh, notions of lattice reduction. The strongest reduction is called HKZ reduction. When a, when a basis is HKZ reduced, its Hermit factor is optimal, its square root of gamma n, and the shape of the X size is very flat, which means this is a strong reduction. On the other hand, it takes exponential time to compute a HKZ reduced basis, so it's impractical. On the opposite, the LLL reduction is a weak reduction. It achieves only an exponential MA factor. There is a big gap between the X size, but it can be computed in polynomial time. What we are studying is a compromise between the two. So it's BKZ, and it's not an algorithm. In fact, it's a hierarchy of algorithms that takes a parameter beta and when beta is equal to 2, bkz is equivalent to LLL. When beta, beta is equal to n, it's equivalent to hkz. Between the two, bkz achieves an exponential Hermit factor, but the constant of the exponent can be made as small as we want by increasing the parameter beta. bkz makes use of hkz in small dimension, in dimension if we apply BKZ on a n-dimensional lattice with a parameter beta, it will make use of HKZ in dimension beta. So it takes at least time, exp uh, time exponential in beta. To have something continuous between BKZ and LLL, we would like to have here something polynomial in M. But as I said, we don't know the, uh, we have no bound on the complexity of BKZ. So we don't know if this question mark can be replaced by poly of n. So a brief history on uh, non result on BKZ and other uh, algorithm of the same family. The definition was given in uh, 1987 and the algorithm a few years later. And uh, an experiment, experimental result, in particular by Gamma and Nguyen, shows that it's very unlikely, in fact, that BKZ is polynomial in n. That is, this question, it's unlikely that this question mark can be poly of n. On the other hand, there are other blockwise algorithms, still between HKZ and LLL, that do have a complexity polynomial in n. However, in practice, BKZ is the most efficient algorithm and achieves the best uh, compromise. That's why it's really worth uh, trying to optimize the complexity of BKZ even if we know other algorithms. So what does the BKZ algorithm do? BKZ is just a, a loop, and it, at each step of the loop, we do a small part of the reduction. During this small part of the, of the reduction, the strong HKZ reduction algorithm is applied at, at most n times in small dim dimension, in dimension beta. So this is the main step of the algorithm. One step of BKZ takes time polynomial in N. The problem is how many times is the, the small reduction step applied? In the standard version of BKZ, it's applied until nothing occurs, that is, uh, until the HKZ, all HKZ reduction do nothing inside the loop but it doesn't work. So what can we do? Here is a curve that shows the evolution of the quality of the basis during the, uh, the execution of BKZ. So it's the time and it's the quality. Uh, it's, uh, when the Hermit factor decreases, the quality uh, improves. So during the first tours, during the 100 first tours, the quality improves quickly. But after that, 
there are many 1,000 loops in this dimension, and between loops 200 and the end, nearly nothing occurs. That's the basis of our result, which is we have not, we didn't prove that BKZ ends in polynomial time, in time polynomial in N, but we have proved uh, something which is nearly as good, which is uh, we can just stop BKZ after a polynomial number of iterations, a polynomial in N, so N power three times something which is nearly negligible, and after this polynomial time, the quality of the BKZ output is nearly as good as what we can prove for the standard version of BKZ for which we have no time bound. In red, it's the bound for the standard version of BKZ, and we have just uh, some epsilon and some, uh, a small constant. That's the only difference. So that's the main idea, just sub BKZ earlier. I will now explain the model that we use to prove this result. For most lattice algorithms, the analysis rely on a potential function, that is, a, numeric, a numerical function of the input that decreases during, uh, decrease during the execution of the algorithm, and it cannot go uh, uh, below a, cer a certain value, so the algorithm must stop. With BKZ, it doesn't work. Or we didn't manage to get it to work, so we used a different technique. Instead of having just one number, we have a full vector. This is the vector of uh, the xi's, that is the norms of the Gram-Schmidt vectors. And we are first analyzing a model in which we made only one assumption, which is HKZ reduction always follow a fixed pattern which correspond to a sort of worst case uh, HKZ reduced basis. And this implies that knowing only the XIs, not the complete basis, but only the XIs, we have all the information to simulate the algorithm. I will show how the model works on this animation. Um, so this is a base, small basis of dimension nine that is uh, we very weakly reduced at the beginning, and I will apply the model of BKZ. It consists in doing HKZ reduction at each position uh, in small dimension. Say the parameter is four, so we'll, we'll do HKZ in dimension four. I start in position one, and it flattens the first block of XIs. Same thing in position two, and so on, until the end, so that, that is, this is one loop of BKZ, and then it starts again. And the main hypothesis, in the main assumption of the model is that the shape of the HKZ block at each step is exactly the same. Once I have said that, it's now a linear algebra problem. Because the first step consists in taking the mean of the first four vectors, which is a matrix multiplication, and then adding a fixed shape, which means we add a constant vector. Same thing in position two, same thing until the end. So a full loop of BKZ, just a combination of matrix multiplication and vector addition, and can be itself expressed as a multiplication by one matrix A, the expression of uh, which can be computed, and a constant vector gamma. And this is, uh, so now this is uh, a linear algebra problem, the analysis of which is uh, merely technical. It's in two steps. Study the fixed point uh, of the system, and the, it, it can be shown that this system as a fixed point which is nearly a line, and the slope of the fixed point is directly related to the Hermit factor. So it corresponds to the Hermit factor uh, that is given in the theorem. And the second step of the, uh, the study of the model is proving that the model has uh, eigenvalues smaller than one to prove that it converges in polynomial time. 
So it's not as simple, but uh, it's nearly as if, uh, well, up to small details, the, small, the largest eigenvalue is one minus something, one over polynomial of n, and this is enough to prove that the dynamical systems converge to the fixed point in polynomial time. This leads to the claim complexity bound. This was the analysis of the model. So, uh, but our result is a result on, not on the, on the model, but on the real algorithm. So this, cannot, this, this analysis cannot be transposed directly uh, to the real algorithm. We have to do a bit of uh, uh, some transformation and some averaging. But in the end, uh, a rigorous adaptation of what has been done on the model, which, which was a, a sort of worst case analysis, can be transposed to the real algorithm and it's enough to obtain the result uh, on the quality of BKZ output. So, in conclusion, uh, we have the first uh, analysis of BKZ. We don't prove that it ends in polynomial time, but the idea is just stop it earlier and it works. The output, of, the output is as a, a good quality. And for that, we used a new method which rely on, on, a, on a model which, can, which we hope, hope can be used to uh, prove other things on blockwise algorithms. So uh, we hope that it will lead to better strategies uh, to reduce lattices and to improve blockwise lattice algorithms. Uh, an open, another open problem is that, in practice, this is a worst case algorithm, and the real BKZ algorithms behave uh, better than the, uh, what is proved in the worst case. So there is still a gap we, we, we would like to explain, and we expect uh, we could improve the model to make it more predictive. Thank you. We have time for a short question. No, this is a worst case analysis for uh, we, are, we, have, we don't know anything for the standard BKZ. We know things only for the BKZ uh, interrupted. So we have a worst case analysis of that, but we can prove that it's as good as the original. If it is as good as the worst case estimate, but you know that BKZ in practice defines... Yes. Does your determinant BKZ also find shorter vectors, or is it always the... So there is a small gap, and that's what I was saying here. We would like to improve the model to uh, fill this gap. But yes, there is a small uh, gap. OK, thanks, the author, again. <laughs> the second talk is uh, pseudo-random knapsacks and uh, sample complexity of LWE, search to decision reductions by Daniel Michancio and Petros Moll. The speaker is Petros. Do you hear me? Okay. Uh, so my name is Petros Moll, and today I'll be talking about uh, search decision reductions for uh, knapsack families and uh, the LWE problem, and this is joint work with uh, uh, my advisor, uh, Daniele Michancio. Is the timing correct? Really? Yep. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> okay, let me start by um, 
are calling the LWV problem. So in the LWV problem, we have a secret uh, vector S, n-dimensional, with coefficients from ZQ, uh, uh, where n and Q are public parameters. And uh, in this problem, we are getting m samples, which uh, each sample is a pair. The first component of the pair uh, is a vector from the same dimension as the, as the secret, randomly and uniformly chosen from ZQ to the n. And uh, each bi is a noise inner product uh, of, of each uh, uh, random vector with a secret, where the noise is uh, uh, some uh, small scalar uh, drawn from a known, publicly known distribution. Okay, and the goal is to find this uh, secret S. Uh, for the rest of the talk, I'll be using this uh, more succinct, succinct representation of LWE. We group all the samples into um, M by N uh, matrix A with uh, random entries. And uh, B uh, is, uh, uh, represents compactly all the uh, BIs. Okay, so a little bit of uh, background information about LWE. Uh, it was introduced initially by Odette Regev in 2005. Uh, it is a generalization of the uh, well-known learning parity with noise problems uh, in larger modulus. And uh, since it has been introduced, it has been uh, very successful in uh, cryptographic constructions. And uh, uh, as you can see here, especially the last three years, it has served as the underlying hardness assumption uh, for uh, many uh, fancy primitives, uh, especially in public key crypto. Okay, a little bit uh, more formal look at LWE. Uh, the parameters is n, the size of the secret, uh, the number of uh, samples, m, q is the modulus, and k is the error distribution. And again, now, uh, this is exactly the problem I defined in my first slide. Given these uh, m random samples, uh, this m uh, by n random matrix A, and m noise inner products with some fixed and common secret S, uh, find S, or equivalently, uh, find this error vector E. And in the decision version of uh, the problem, we are again given this uh, uh, m by n random matrix A, and uh, our goal is to decide uh, whether this, uh, the, the second component of the input, this vector t, uh, it corresponds to an LW instance, uh, that is m, linearly, uh, m noisy inner products uh, with a secret s, or some random vector from zq to the m, which is completely independent uh, from everything else. Okay, so the talk focuses on uh, the, uh, understanding the hardness of these two problems and how their hardness uh, relates with each other. Uh, but before doing that, why do we even care in the first place? Okay, in cryptography, uh, we do need uh, decision problems. Uh, these are the ones that are appropriate uh, for uh, the crypto constructions, and that's the case for uh, LWE2. Uh, in particular, all uh, known LWE-based constructions rely on the decisional version of LWE. And uh, this is mainly due to the fact that uh, most of the security definitions we have in crypto have a very strong indistinguishability uh, flavor. Okay, on the other hand, the search problems, uh, from an algorithmic point of view, we do understand their hardness uh, better. So over the time, they have undergone uh, more study by, by the community. And uh, now, uh, the nice thing about the search to decision reductions is that uh, they somehow bring those two uh, families of problems together. And uh, given search to decision reductions, we are able to prove uh, claims such as a primitive pi is secure under some notion of security, uh, just by assuming that the corresponding search problem uh, is hard. Okay, our results. Uh, we provide a tool set uh, for uh, studying search to decision reductions uh, for LWE in the special case where the, the noise is polynomially bounded. And uh, uh, as an added feature of our reductions, the, uh, these reductions turn out to be uh, sample preserving. Uh, I'll come back to that uh, at the end of my talk. And uh, uh, we give uh, similar search to decision uh, results uh, for uh, generalized knapsack functions. Um, and also, in particular, we give some uh, part powerful and easy to check uh, criteria uh, in order to prove search to decision equivalence. And uh, I actually saw that uh, these, the first two bullets are somehow uh, related. And uh, along the way, uh, we use in a new context some uh, techniques from Fourier analysis. Uh, and this might be interesting because these ideas might find some applications uh, elsewhere. Okay, let me actually start from the, the second bullet, and I'll uh, come back to LWE towards the end of the, of the talk. Okay, so what is a, a knapsack family? It is parameterized by some integer m uh, and a finite abelian group g, 
And we also have this uh, set S of uh, integer multipliers. So S is a subset of integers uh, where this, the maximum value, uh, this S, the small S, is polynomially bounded in the parameter M. And now um, a random knapsack family is a, uh, is a function with domain uh, the m-dimensional uh, vectors of multipliers and trains this group G. Uh, if we want to sample, we just have to uh, sample m independent and uniformly random uh, group elements. And then evaluation uh, is simply take each uh, group element gi multiplied by the corresponding uh, uh, multiplier from the vector of multipliers and then add everything up uh, to form a single uh, group element. And uh, just for ease of notation, I'll be using this uh, uh, dot product notation uh, instead of the uh, right-hand side uh, sum. Okay, so many, uh, many instances of, uh, in, in cryptography actually uh, are subcases of this general description I gave above. Maybe the most uh, representative example is this uh, random modular subset sum. Uh, this is the specific case where uh, the set of multipliers is just the binary set. Either we get an element or we omit it. And uh, the underlying group is the cyclic group uh, Z sub M. All right, so now if we consider a fixed uh, uh, specific distribution on the uh, vector of uh, multipliers, the integer multipliers, then the, uh, we have the same two uh, problems for the knapsack functions, namely, uh, the search problem, given a description of an element, of, a description of a member of the knapsack family, and uh, the image of some uh, uh, input x that follows some pre-specified distribution, find this uh, unknown image x. And um, the, the, the decision problem is uh, very naturally defined as we are either given, uh, we are we're given this uh, uh, random member of the knapsack family. And also, we are given either the image of some, of some unknown uh, input x or a completely uh, uniform and independent element u. And our task is to say which is the case. Um, uh, so just for ease of presentation, I'll be using this uh, uh, calligraphic k of uh, g, d to denote the family of knapsack functions that, have, uh, that are defined uh, over this group, g, and that have input distribution this um, uh, distribution D. And I'll be borrowing standard terms from, uh, from cryptography. Whenever the, the search problem is hard, I'll just say that uh, the corresponding family is one way. And uh, similarly, for the distinguishing problem, uh, if the decision problem is hard, uh, I'll just say that the, the family is uh, pseudo-random, or PRG in short. OK, so what do we know uh, about uh, the search decision connections for knapsack problems? Uh, so, in Pagliaccio now, in their paper in 89, they proved uh, that uh, decision, the decision problem is as hard as the search problem for the specific case where the multipliers are uh, binary. Uh, so, this is the, the subset sum problem. And uh, G is the cyclic group Z sub M. And uh, Fisher and Stern extended the, the result uh, uh, for the vector group uh, G, uh, with Z2 to the K. And uh, for uh, input distribution, the uniform distribution over all uh, m-bit vectors with a pre-specified Hamming weight. All right, so we'd like to take a step further and uh, ask ourselves, OK, is this true for other families, uh, uh, for other groups too, or for other input distributions? Ideally, we would like a clean search to decision uh, equivalence for uh, ideally every uh, group G, finite group G, and every distribution. Unfortunately, that's not the case. Um, however, it turns out that if we add this uh, additional condition uh, in, the, in the red frame, uh, the, the implication becomes, uh, becomes true. So, and this is in fact the main theorem of, uh, technical theorem of our uh, uh, paper. Uh, and it basically says that the decision problem is hard, assuming the search problem is hard, and also some other uh, related decision problems are hard. And by related, I mean problems defined uh, for knapsack families that uh, have ranges related group. So this uh, quotient uh, uh, sub subgroup of uh, the initial group G. 
And uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this, uh, on this condition, but uh, it might uh, seem at first sight that this is a very artificial condition just to make the proof work. The only thing that I will say is that um, in reality it's not, this, this condition is not restrictive at all. It's much, uh, much less uh, restrictive than it seems. In particular, in many interesting uh, cases, this restriction holds in a very strong information uh, theoretic sense. So in reality, we, we really don't have uh, to check anything else for many interesting groups, and uh, we get a clean uh, uh, search decision uh, equivalence. Uh, so for example, this is the case uh, when for any group and any input distribution, as long as the multipliers are binary. So if we are working on any finite abelian group G, and uh, our distribution is only defined over the m-bit uh, strings, uh, then we get uh, search decision equivalence uh, unconditionally. And uh, just note here that uh, this implication alone uh, generalizes the result by Impagliazzo and Aur uh, and Fischer and Stern. Same thing for groups with uh, prime exponent and uh, any distribution. And uh, also another nice thing is that uh, we can use all these nice tricks from information theory, leftover has lemma, uh, bounds on the entropy of distribution, etc., etc., and get uh, similar results for other cases of groups. Okay, so just one quick slide about the proof. Uh, we want to show how to solve the search problem uh, by having a distinguisher for the decision problem. We do the, uh, the, the trick uh, by, used by Impagliazzo and Aor, so we break down the proof into two parts by introducing this intermediate notion of a predictor. Uh, so this is again the outline by Impagliazzo and Aor. However, due to the generality of our result, the details are uh, uh, fairly, fairly different. In particular, in this, in this uh, step one, uh, Impagliazzo and Aor readily used the Goldreich uh, Levin hardcore predicate. In our case, we have to derive general conditions uh, that allows to invert uh, such a function, such a knapsack uh, function, just by giving noisy predictions for x dot r, for random vectors r, modulo some number that might not uh, be necessarily uh, prime. So neither Goldreich-Levin or the Goldreich-Rubenfeld-Sudan uh, results uh, are enough in this setting. Okay, and so for, for this step, we use as a tool uh, a nice algorithm developed by Akavia, Goldwasser, and Safra uh, for learning heavy Fourier coefficients of uh, general functions. Step two, uh, again, we, we managed to show that uh, there is a, a way to use the distinguisher to get a predictor that satisfies exactly the general condition of step one. Won't get into the details. This is actually the most technical part of the proof. Uh, you can see, you can take a look at the, at the paper if you are uh, interested. Okay, let me just now come back to the LWE as promised in the, in the beginning of my talk. Uh, for that, uh, for that uh, part, we use some uh, known du duality between uh, LWE and knapsack problems. So if you flip the, uh, an LWE instance, so if you see it from a different point of view, it turns out that uh, uh, this LWE instance can be transformed to the, this knapsack instance, where this matrix G, I have grouped all M elements uh, from the group into this big matrix G. In the error correcting uh, codes uh, language, this is exactly the parity check uh, matrix uh, for the query code generated by, uh, by matrix A. And uh, the important thing to notice here is that the, the only component, the only quantity that, uh, uh, that unifies these two uh, problems is this uh, vector E, the error vector, and the, that is the, the, the error vector of LWE becomes the unknown input in the knapsack instance. And also it turns out that all the distribution work out nicely. If you start from a random uh, a matrix A, you get a random uh, matrix G. All right, so a similar transformation works also the other way around, uh, which is uh, very convenient. And if you put all the, the pieces together, uh, you can go all the way from the search LWE to the decision LWE through uh, the, the corresponding knapsack problems and use all the, the machinery and the, the, the strong theorem we had from, uh, uh, for knapsacks uh, for search decision. Okay, so what does this mean in particular for LWE? Uh, uh, using this connection, we are able to uh, reprove uh, or all previously known uh, uh, such reductions with bounded error uh, for uh, learning with errors and for LPN. And also we're able to get some search decision reductions uh, for instances of LWE uh, not considered before. 
And uh, as an additive benefit, uh, we get uh, that our reductions are sample preserving, meaning that all the previous reductions proved that uh, M samples from the LWV distributions are indistinguishable, but they have to assume that the corresponding search problem is uh, hard given a, a higher number of samples. Still polynomially related to M, but a higher number of, uh, of samples. Uh, in contrast, our reductions are sample preserving, so if one can solve the decision problem given M samples, then uh, he, he can also uh, solve the uh, search version given the same number of M problems. Of course, the caveat here is that uh, there is a degradation in the success probability. So if you start with some probability uh, distinguishing advantage epsilon, this will do go down the, the inverting probability. But this, this seems to be unavoidable. All right, so why should we care about uh, the number of samples? Um, the reason is that in actual uh, instantiation of schemes, uh, the, there is a certain number of uh, LWV samples exposed. And now the nice thing about the sample preserving reductions is that we can base the, the, the security of these schemes on the, the hardness of the search problem when given exactly M samples. And uh, from a concrete algorithmic point of view, that's interesting that because uh, some known attacks against the uh, LWE, one wayness of LWE, such as the, uh, some lattice attacks and some recent algebraic uh, attacks, seems to be, uh, seem to be sensitive in the number of uh, samples exposed. And uh, in its extreme manifestation, this phenomenon, uh, uh, there, are, there, are, uh, there are cases of parameters of LWE where if given enough number of samples, we can completely uh, break LWE. Whereas with fewer samples, the attack doesn't seem uh, to, be, to be working. Okay, so let me conclude with some uh, open problems. All the uh, sample preserving reductions that I mentioned before uh, work uh, whenever the, the noise is bounded. It would be nice to extend this uh, to the unbounded uh, noise case. Uh, and uh, especially lately, this, uh, the LWE with super polynomial noise has been used in several applications. So this problem is uh, well motivated. Uh, just uh, let me mention here that we do know how to get search to decision reduction for LWE for some uh, parameters and super polynomial noise by the work of Piker, but these reductions are not uh, sample preserving. And uh, the similar landscape for the algebraic variant of LWE, the ring LWE, uh, we do know sample, uh, non sample preserving reductions, but unfortunately, no uh, sample preserving ones are known. Thank you. Very short question, if any. Okay, then let's thank the speaker again.